So last time we talked about the plan. And as I mentioned to you, the book, there's an English book called The Great Mission, which at least begins with this story wonderfully presented in, in a relatively speaking orderly fashion, in chronological order. So the Hashem was a tzaddik mister and a member of the Chabura, a member of the group of tzaddikim mistarim. And there was a leader. The leader was Reb Adam Baal Shem. It seems like Reb Adam Baal Shem continued, it was, uh, and Baal Shem upon him had, had significant tarikh as Yomim. Because even when the Baal Shem was learning with Achia Hashiloimim, and even when the Baal Shem had to reveal himself, which is Tov Tzavid apparently Reb Adam Baal Shem was still alive. He had a tarikh as Yomim. And he, the Baal Shem, organized that tarikh as Yomim. The Baal Shem Tov's plan about helping Yidin first be Gashmias Panosim, and that only afterwards you could help Yidin be Ruchnias, was implemented. And like it says in the Sikhis, the Baal Shem Tov was elevated to a certain concept, a certain standard of leadership within the movement of the Zikim Nistadim because of this. Now, the Baal Shem Tov, of course, practiced what he preached. He had this initiative, he had this idea, he himself was involved in it. And we know certain very famous details about the Vashamta's involvement with, the tzaddikim, with, with this work of uh, helping Yidin. The most famous is that the Vashamta was called a behelfer. A behelfer we would call today uh, uh, a, uh, a glorified bus driver. <laughs> the Vashamta essentially took children to and from Chay, that he made the impression, he gave the impression, as if it was an ish of the Yisrael, and um, he would pick the children up from Chaydin and bring them to the Malamid. Take the children from the Malamid and bring them home. Now, the poorest people in town were the Malamdin. So if the Baal Shem Tev was a behelfer to Malamid and assisted Malamid, he said, give us nachmer on him. It gives you an idea how the Baal Shem Tev lived. And he would take the children to the Chaydin and from the Chaydin and their vaile, he would teach them. Meidani, Tehidet Siva, Brochus, the Helika Magid. The musician Magid used to say, I wish myself that I should kiss a Sefer with the Zelbe Liebschaft for the Baal Shem Tov for the Kush, the Kinderlach, which says the Gefrit for Chede. The Holy Magad said, I wish I should kiss the Sefer Tede with the same Ahava that the Holy Baal Shem Tov kissed the little Kinderlach when he took them to and from the Chedarim. And for a Meshach man, he was a Behelfer. And of course, part of this was his, his, his being a Nister. He, he behaved like he was an Amaretz, a Pashtarid, and this was one of the symptoms of it, that he did such a simple task. Another thing we know about the Baal Shem Tev, as a matter of fact, was that he was a sheikhet. He was a sheikhet eifes. I don't know if he sheikhted behemoths, but he sheikhted chickens. And um, I guess being a sheikhet didn't require him to be a very big Talmud Chach. Baal Shem Tev was a sheikhet. And the story goes that a yid, a, a, a yeshuvnik, had a chicken. And he used to go every Friday to the Baal Shem Tev to sheikh the chicken. And uh, he didn't go himself. He sent the goy, which is a very big shal in Aloha, but Basar Shin Salman Ayin. I don't know the tennis to this kasha, but the Zay is the Maisen. The goy comes back one Friday and the chicken is still alive. So he says to the so the Balaba says to the goy, Why is the chicken still alive? He says, Because Thrul, but the goy called him Thrul. Thrul wasn't there. Was there another Shaykh? He says, Yes, Shok was Shaykh. So why didn't you let the other Shaykh Shaykh the chicken? He says, Because eh, he. He's a mezuyif. He's a, a felcher. He's a phony. He says, what makes him into a felcher? What makes him into a phony? He says, Yenem shaykh, the shaykh is through. Before he shechted a chicken, he used to rinse the chalaf with his tears. This shaykh dunks it into a cup of water. He said, this is the shkinah, Mr. Shaykh. That's not how you should have the shaykh. He was used to the Baal Shem Tev. How did the Baal Shem Tev shech the chicken? Every time he shechted the chicken, he rinsed the chalaf with tered. You understand? The new shaykh, that's what every shaykh does. He dunks the shaykh, the chalaf into water. He says, he's like in the shech. That's not kosher. You're not going to eat that chicken. The guy, before a shech and shech, he cries enough tears to rinse the shech, the chalaf. This is the Baal Shem Tev. Now, just to share some stories about the tkufa, the Baal Shem Tev's nistaros. There's some stories. The first story is in the in the Shmuel uh, Sipurim from Falakan that the Heleke Rujne Rebbe, Sol Rujne, is Gefarim. He traveled. And the Baal Shem Tev's name was Yisrael, it was Amel Nachem Baal Shem Tev. 
And the Polish of the tale, I don't know how true it is, but the Polish say that the Halik Yerushina was the Nisham of the Balshemtev. The Balshemtev had, had been asked when he's coming back. And the Balshemtev said in 50 years. The Yerushina was born in Tafkuf Nunzayim. It's Chabdraisik Zibn Yad, 37 years after the Histalkas. And people said that he was the Nisham of the Balshemtev. And they also said that he was supposed to be born to the Balshemtev's kinder. And there was a Psaninya and there was a Psnishta, there was a Nishta. The Seder and the Balshemtev's children lost the Schus. And that's why the Helik Yerushna was a child of the Magid. He was a great grandson of the Mazisha Magid, not of the Balshem. The Yerushna Rebbe was a Tzadik Elian, an incredible man, as a child, as a child. The Gedalia Hasidus used to stand in his presence and shake, tremble, hand and foot, from Pachat. And he, as a Zachke Farm, he traveled a lot. And he came to a village, it was called Sruva, a village someplace on the, on the border near Ukraine, a place called Sruva. And it seemed suspicious to him. So he asked to find out what is the name of this town. Why is it called Sruv? And nobody knew. Until somebody told him there's a goy, a zokin, an old goy, he's is almost 100 years old. And he was around when this wasn't even a town yet. And it was still wilderness. And he probably knows the name, why it's called Sruv. So the Hele Kedushan said they should bring this goy to him. So this altar goy was brought to the Hele Kedushan. And he came dressed in a foot and a big, thick, heavy coat made from a, bur- a bear's skin. And he sits down and he tells him the story. He says, I was a teenager, he says. And here was wilderness. Here was wilderness. And uh, we used to bring our sheep to pasture on these hills. And we saw a holy man. The holy man was always in the mountains. He was constantly walking along the tops of the mountains. We never exchanged a word with him. He never exchanged a word with him. The only thing we knew is he knew that his name was Thru. He threw, Thru. Every day he would come down from the mountains into the valley and he would take off his clothes and he would immerse himself in the water. In the winter, he would literally break the ice and immerse himself in the water. And we would see on the ice blood because when he would come out of the water, his his wet feet would stick to the ice and would pull push it to the skin and we would see the blood on the ice. We felt bad for him, he said. So we used to put down mats, shmatas. They would get shmatas. And when this holy man would, would immerse from the water, they would put out little, like, shmatas. And then when he would walk out of the mix, he push it, wouldn't bleed. But we never exchanged the word. But here at Yehid, it was in spring, and a bear came out of its winter hibernation and came to one of our herds and took away a sheep. The next day, the bear came again, took Nacham Allah And we didn't know what to do. To lose a sheep every day to a bear is not good business. So we uh, tried to mobilize ourselves. We got together. We brought things to make a lot of noise. We brought sticks and stones. We were going to frighten the bear, but the bear would come and take a sheep. One day, we knew the bear was coming. And we were all there, all the shepherds together, and they were in a panic. And we see through. So we screamed to him, there's a bear, we need help. <laughs> and he started walking towards us. And he starts walking towards us. The bear stops and stares at this holy man. And the holy man stares at the bear. Walked closer and closer and closer and closer. And at a certain point, he called me. So I made a big circle around the bear. And I walked up to him. He says, the bear is dead. Go to the bear, take his skin and make yourself a coat. So I was afraid. I started throwing stones. The bear didn't move. I came closer. I pushed. The bear was stone cold, dead. So I skinned the bear. And he says, this is the coat that I have from that bear. So the Helik Yerushin had asked the Goy, he said, I'm a grandson of that holy man. Can I have the coat? So he gave him the coat. Before the Yerushin had left town, the Goy died. And they buried him. And the Yerushin is arc. The Rebish that kept an altar goy alive for a hundred years that the coat that came from the Baal Shem Tov should reach me. This is one of the stories of Shantabal Tzadista. Nocha which is more famous, this is already in the Akut HaDevurim, in the Sikhs, that uh, there was a Yid. This is in the Akut HaDevurim. The Rashi was in the Fidik There was a Yid whose parents died when he was before Bar Mitzvah. Kid. And he was adopted by his uncle. His uncle was a blacksmith, a Pashtadid, a sincere Jew, a wonderful Jew. And he brought him into his home and he sent him to Cheder. 
And the child had no Hatzlocha Bali Murdu, nothing. The Torah wouldn't go into his head. His friends learned Aleph Beis, he come no Aleph. His friends learned the Nikudas, he come learned Beis. His friend learned how to read, he was learning Gimel. He was learning Chumash, Mamash, with the Felach. And Friedrich describes how the Malamed gathered all the children together and he explained to them what it means, Ayosim. What's this mean? Akita Anatati. Parents. And he explained to the children that Ayosim Nebuch has Primis Dike pain inside and they have to be sensitive to Ayosim. And the Friedrich Ebbe says that the children then had such a sincerity that they were very sensitive to this boy. They always included him in their games. Nobody ever made fun of him. But the kid was already becoming, he was 9, 10, 11, 12, he was barely reading. So his uncle, the Schmid, took him into the Geshefti. He was a blacksmith. He took him in as an apprentice. And by the time he came by Mitzah, I think had to read. And he knew Baruchas Balpeh. He knew the Baruchas by heart. If I'm not mistaken, he used to recite Baruchas until somebody told him. He would recite Baruchas Balpeh. That's all he knew. Because he wanted to say Teireh. Until somebody told him he was not allowed. But as terrible as he was as a Teireh, that's how good he was at this new Geshefti. He was an incredible blacksmith. He had incredible hands. And he was, in a short time, as good and better than his uncle. So when he was about 14 years old, his uncle found him by Yosema, a girl also with no parents, made a chasana for them, and moved him to a short distance away, in other words, within traveling distance, and he opened up his own shop. And in a short time, he became famous as the blacksmith with the golden hands. And from all around, people used to come to him to fix their wheels and to to uh, turn on horseshoes and all whatever has to be done on blacksmith. And he was, he was a mid, he had Panasa Barchova. He lived with his wife in this village and uh, they had several children. As they like. In the town where he lived, there were very, very few passers by. So it was a terrible competition for Achnas So whenever a guest would come to town, there would be a goidel. They would make a lottery who should get the Eirech. And the Seder was that after you won Eirach uh, once, you couldn't get the guest again until anybody in town got a chance to get an Eirach. But here, Yoim, a guest comes to town and nobody wants him. So he said, the blacksmith said, I'll take him. But the Tnai is that it doesn't go off my cheshman of the girl. Why did nobody want him? The man smelled, smelled, stunk to high heavens. And his body was full of bruises of, of, of open wounds that were oozing a very, very, very stinking pus. He was a very, very, he was a diseased man. So this black, blacksmith took him home and cleaned him. He washed him and he uh, put compresses on the, all of his wounds, all over his body. And he uh, gave him ointments and he made him into a mensch. He started to clean him up. His, his wounds started to heal. His smell went away. And he made a mensch out of it. So one day he says to this, how did you become so, so diseased, so infected with all kinds of wounds all over his skin? So he tells him, I'll tell you the truth, I am a ben teda. I'm a ben teda, I'm a chacham, I'm a lanzim. And it's known amongst the b'nei teda that if a person wants to grow in limud teda, there's an age of sigufim. Pinek in the guf, to punish the body. So each day I would go out for a Meshach's man and sit on a nest of ants that bit into my flesh. And they made me so diseased. And I'm wandering from place to place in Golis, as was the tradition by the Gedele Yisrael in those days. And I'm hoping that this will help. The Reb Shet Mehel, my mind will open up. I'll be able to learn Teda on a higher Madrid. So the blacksmith says to himself, if this could work for a person who's a Ben Teda, it certainly could work for me. His wife was in a yadachas with him. She also was very, very involved in his pain about his amaratzis, the fact that he couldn't learn. And he told his wife this, and he started a new life. A half a day he would work in the shmid, until noon he would work in his business. And then he would go out into the forest, he would sit on a nest of meat-eating ants, and he would say, till him and cry and beg that Abishan, the cup of the half of the candle and the have a You're about to learn the Abishan's holy day. This went on for a man, Rav, Meshach's man, I don't know, One day he was out there in the fields, and he's sitting there and saying to him and crying, and asking the Abish that you should be able to learn Teira. And a man walks up to him, with a shtekin, with a torbe, with a big fiery red beard, with a stick, 
and a, a bag over his shoulder and a rope around his waist and he sees this Yid and he tells him Shalom Aleichem they exchange a few words he says to him what are you doing? what are you doing? so he tells him the mice that I had by me in my house I'm a Chochem and he told me that if you want your mind to open up to Teda the eight is the Guf so the man with the red beard says I have for you a much easier eight what is the eight? the eight is if you will give me everything your own you won't. I will take you with me, and in two years I will teach you kala the whole thing. But said, okay, deal. <laughs> Let's do it. What's up? So he says to him, wait, relax. First of all, go home and consult with your wife. And he explains to him, there's no obligation for every Jew to be a big ben tater. You could serve Hashem by giving tzedaka and supporting leg the tater, and it's just as good as learning tater. Go home, talk to your wife, talk, consult with your uncle. So he comes home and he tells his wife, full of excitement, guess what, we're going to be broke, we're going to be schnud, is not going to have a home, but I'll learn kola teda kula. And she was just as excited as him. But then he went to talk to his uncle, and his uncle poured water on the parade. Like, what's that? what kind of craziness is this? Who ever heard of such a thing? You, he's right. You'll give money to support lame day teda, and you'll be eight of teda through supporting teda. Who's the best we have been teda? So a whole week, his uncle and his aunt and him and his wife were in this conversation, this negotiations. And anyway, when the week ended, they decided that they're going ahead. So the following week, whatever day it was, Tuesday, he goes out into the same place in the field, and he meets the man with the red beard. And he says, my wife and I agree, but that night. is, yes, since we're going to give everything up and we're going to have no money, before we give it to you, we want that you should come to us to eat a meal in our home. We should have an opportunity to be machnasedek one last time. And he agreed. So he comes into the house. The kids are dressed in big day Shabbos. And there's candles on the table. And he engages the children in conversation. And he asks the children, why are there candles on the table? Why are you dressed in big day Shabbos? So they tell him, lefitumam, bapashtas, whenever we have a guest, we ask it to yom. And since you're going to be our guest, so we're all dressed in big day Shabbos, we have candles on the table. And they sat down, they had a meal. And after they bench, the man takes out a piece of paper and he makes a shtar. What do you own? I own a house, I own a business, and I have this kind of equipment. And I'll first write it. And um, he writes a document saying that all of the possessions of this person belong to me, to him. And they signed it. Then he says, bring me a bag, a sack. And into the sack, they put all of his wealth, all of his liquid. He had a lot of money, he had some gold and silver kingdom out of Anglo Kazakh this is taking with him. And then he says to him, Bring me another sack. And in the second sack he puts all kinds of seeds, wheat and barley and other corns and grains. And he says to the wife as follows, I am taking your husband with me. We will be back in two years. You should know the house you're living in is mine. The field around your house is mine. The blacksmith is mine. But you could live in it. Take these seeds you'll plant them in the field so your children will have what to eat until your husband can come home and again make a living because I'm taking him with me and they left and two years later this kid came back and he resumed his practice as a blacksmith but now he was a tzaddik mister and the Baal Shem Tov says the yid with the red beard who met him was the helik of Baal Shem Tov says the yid with the red beard who made this deal with him was the helik of Baal Shem this story Baal Shem Tov was a tzaddik mister now, what about the Baal Shem Tov's marriage? Now, first of all, understand we know very little about the Baal Shem Tov's early years. I mean, you have a little bit in the Sikhs from Friedrich and Rebbe, but about the Rebbe's Baal Shem Tov's husband, you don't have. In the, in the Shivchei Baal Shem Tov, you do have a little bit about it. In Derech Agav, I heard this myself from the Rebbe, but also in the Yus Kedish. The Rebbe holds the Baal Shem, Tov, Baal Shem Tov was a safe that the Alter Rebbe himself looked over. The printer of Shivchei Abal Shem Tev was Matrem Zachosi, not the writer of the Sefer, but the printer. The Bishol Yafe, I think, was the Slavita printer, and he brought the Shivchei Abal Shem Tev to the Alter Rebbe. Alter Rebbe looked it over. In fact, if you've ever seen the Shivchei Abal Shem Tev, like six or seven pages into the Sefer, it says Ad Kan Misipuri Harav, <laughs> Ad Kan Misipuri Harav. All of these stories till now from the Rav. And there are people who say, At Kad Misipuri Rav, Mishpashta Alter Rebbe added stories in the beginning of the Sefer. And the real demises, the sugar demises, about the Baal Shem Tov's father, Rebbe Leyezer, Metakyanim, 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 Metak
Chalifin, the Shukh Moshe Shantav the Rebbe holds is very reliable. And if, I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this, Shukh Moshe Shantav. Shukh Moshe Shantav, Shantav, you cannot read, you have to learn it. It's Sipurim, but there's Sipurim Toichni and Meyoyim. And it's almost Matim, 100% with the Sikhs and Sidi Kirev. Shukh Moshe Shantav, the, the, the Gvald applies this from Moshe Shantav. But by us, it's all going to be Shukh Moshe Shantav. And over there, you have a little bit about the Moshe Shantav's marriages. First of all, there is a Shita, Yesh Imam, that says Moshe Shantav was married twice. And there's also an assumption that the children that he had were from his second marriage. In the Gniza Achresonis, the names of the Rebetzin and the Baal Shem Tev appear. In a few places, the Baal Shem Tev's Rebetzin is called Chane. In most places, the Baal Shem Tev's Rebetzin's name is either Leia Rochel or Rochel Leia. It's obviously a mistake. I don't know what her name was, either Leia Rochel or Rochel Leia. Could you presume that the two Rebetzin, they said, Zivag Rishon was Chane, Zivag Sheni was Rochel Leia, Leia Rochel, I, I doubt it. But, but as they, in the Gniza Chersonis, which we know is, is Oiska Halton, but that it was copied quickly, and therefore there are small mistakes, you have all of these stidus. Amor Shtet Chane, but then Achar Shtet Oder Leia Rochel, Oder Rochel Leia, about the Baal Shem Tov's Rebbet. So Baal Shem Tov was married twice, as they Zok Develt, in the Sefer of Nisui and Nisim, he brings two Zivigs, but I don't think he brings another name. B'chol the Baal Shem Tov's second Zivig was... Uh, the mother of his children, Rosh had a son and a daughter. Rosh son's name was Reb Tzvi. Rosh daughter's name was Adel. She's much more famous than him. I'll explain this all soon. Rosh there's a presumption she got married based on became 18 years old. He reached the age of Meshmei What's the story? Rosh Hashem He traveled a lot. And he, of course, uh, was a Tzadik Nistri. And a nister meant he pushed it, looked like a prostate person. He didn't just act like a prostate person. He looked at his face, he looked like a simple man. So the story is that in route, while he was traveling, he met the Rav of Brod. Brod was the Irvain Yisrael. Brod had hundreds of Rabonim, G'doylim, G'oyni Yisrael, who sat and learned in a, in a cloise. You know, had no shaykhs to the world, Bechlau. To be the Rav of Brod, you had to put up with a lot of stiff critics. Befraim, he was a Gormelo. And he met the Baal Shem Tev. And the Baal Shem Tev saw Baruch Kotche that this is his shved. This is his, this is the, his, his prospective father-in-law. So how the Baal Shem Tev did this, I don't know. But the Baal Shem Tev allowed the Shem Tev to know who he is. It's a Gala So he was very, very impressed. The Kedush of the Baal Shem Tev, the Goynus of the Baal Shem Tev. She says to the Baal Shem Tev, I have a daughter. And I would like you to consider marrying her. And the Baal Shem Tev agreed. He said, Baal Shem come to Brod, and you'll meet her. I will make it know him. So Baal Shem says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to make it know him right now. Right now, we're meeting now, let's make it know him. And they made know him. They, took, they made two identical studies, two legal documents the same. And they wrote that Yisrael, Rebbe Leezer, from Tlust, was betrothed, was engaged to the daughter of the Befraim of Brod and the Vegans, and they both signed the document. And of course, as God would have it, Rabbi Ephraim Abrod never made it home. He died in some place along the route. And naturally, his family was informed. They came, they re- took his remains, they buried him, and they found this shtar. A document which, which identifies the chosm of their now sister and daughter. And one fine day, a, a, a farmer shows up in town with the, other, with the matching document. I'm the sober of Eliezer. And they looked at him and they said, that's impossible. Anyway, the Baal Shem Tev played the part to the end. <coughs> and they, were, they couldn't understand how this could be. <laughs> so Rabbi and Kitev said, there must be some mistake, we have to break this shidduch. And uh, he was trying to impress upon his sister, the Kala, that she should also break the shidduch. And the Baal Shem Tev asked to speak to her in private. Anyway, the Baal Shem Tev spoke to her in private, and to her... She saw the truth, but he explained to her that the Vaila, even her brother, is not allowed to know who he is. So she said to her brother, my father made the Shidduch, I don't understand why, but I want to honor this last wish of his, and they got married. And they lived in Brod. And upon him, it, it appears at the beginning of the year, it started in Brod, later he moved 
away. But the, when the, the first Medach Yesh Lady, when he was 26, um, again, we're assuming he got married around 18, was still living in Brod. And for Rabbi Gershon Kitavet, this was a nightmare. He was the he was the he was the rabbi of Brod. He took over his father's position, and he has a brother-in-law a vister amoritz. He didn't know how to read. He would say a bracha with 15 mistakes. There's a letter in the Geniza with the Balshem Tov writes that Rabbi Gershon Kitavet Tov Peites, Tov Peites. The Baal Shem Tov was 21. He was born Tov Nunches. Yeah? <coughs> no, Samach Ayin Pei. He was 31. He writes to Rabbi Gershon Kitavet, I took myself a job as a behel for Tom Malamed. He writes it in a broken Yiddish. I took a job as an assistant Malamed because I know how much it bothers you that I'm such an Amharat. But it's not my fault. My parents died when I was young and I was an orphan. And I'm planning to learn how to read and write. <laughs> Baal Shem Tov writes it. 31 years old, he says, I'm going to work, I'm becoming an assistant Malamed. So I'll also be able to listen in as the Malamed teaches the children how to read. It's a printed letter. They moved to the edge of town. And there was some Meshach's mad that Baal used to handle with mud. He would bring wagon loads of mud and they'd make ovens from it. He had different jobs. His wife ran a base marzeach. Base marzeach means a tavern. She ran a moonshine. They made whiskey, alcohol, liquor. And that's how they made a living. And uh, he was doing his thing. Baal Shem Tov never worked. He was always busy in El Rosal Yenin. And Baal Shem Tov supported them. And Rabbi Gershon Kitavet couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, it was too difficult for him. So at first they moved away, they moved to the edge of town. And eventually they moved to a different city. Later the Baal Shem Tov would reveal himself to Rabbi Gershon Kitavet, And Rabbi Gershon Kitavet became one of the first G'dayli Yisrael who were in support of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov became a Rebbe Nasi, a Tzadik Begolu. But as a Tzadik Nistel, at least for a Meshach's man, the Baal Shem Tov concealed himself from his own brother-in-law. Now, the Baal Shem Tov had two children. A son and a daughter. His son's name was Reb Tzvi. There are Chassidah Shegezeh, Ada Yeh that traced themselves to the Baal Shem Tov's son, Reb Tzvi. He was a very, very, very big Tzadik. Baal was a kind. Aisha Lekim Kaddish. But he was a mufshet. He had no shaykhahs to the world. And he was not in any way a manhig. He had no public presence. He was a private person. So we know the story. I'll talk about it later about Iches. He actually was Mamala and came of it. He became the Rebbe when his father passed away. And Hasidus started to fall to pieces. And after one year, he announced that his father came to him and told him that he's not the Rebbe, the Mizitcha Magid is the Rebbe. And he, he became a private citizen. He became a push to private citizen. No doubt, undoubtedly, the more famous it was his daughter, the Rebbe's in Adel, the Hashem daughter Adel, was Gorgora Gresic, she was an incredibly great woman. And uh, the great Hasidic dynasties that we know that come from the Hashem genes are from her. Kedem called her name was Adel, Alav Dalad Lamed. The Hashem said, Van kum de nomen Adel. He says, I was looking for a neshama for my daughter, Habachaz Genomen from the Tere. He, named, he gave his daughter a neshama from the Tere, and her name was Adel, which is a Rosh Hashanah's Eish Das Lame. You know, so when your neshama is from the Tere, I guess it's not ordinary. She was very, very big tzaddikis. There's interesting letters the Baal Tov to her, where the Baal Tov needed, he had, Baal Tov had a safer of food, he had a safer of medicines. I can imagine that it wasn't exactly uh, Western medicine, it probably wasn't homeopathy either. Baal Shem Tov's refus. So he writes his daughter a letter, I need my safer of food, please send it to me, but Laman Hashem, don't read it. <laughs> don't open the book, take it out of the place where I keep it, send it to me, but Bashum Mefi, don't read it, don't look inside. Baal Shem Tov's daughter, Adu. And she, she was the mother of some very famous personalities. The Machmen Brasleve was her grandson. Her daughter was Fege. Adol's daughter was Fege. The Machmen the Machmen of Fege, Ben Fege, right? Her, her sons are very famous. The older of her sons was the Degel Machmen Ephraim. His name was Ephraim. And it's Mustafa that he was named Taka after her. His maternal grandmother, grandfather, his Baal Shem Tov Shver, a great grandfather, and he the Siddler covered up. Dega Bachne Ephraim, he's very famous. He knew the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov then got of it. He was close to the Baal Shem Tov, and in his safe, Dega Bachne Ephraim, you have a lot of taters in the Baal Shem Tov. The younger son, who's also even more famous, but he was born after the Baal Shem Tov passed away. I think he Bichal didn't know the Baal Shem Tov was the Rebbe Rabbeinu. Rabbeinu Meshbush. This was her children. 
And um, she was very, very famous. She was a very, very big tzaddik. It's about Shem She, her husband's name was Abichil. Abichil the Daicho. He was a, a German Jew, a big tzaddik. This is who she married. The next thing that we need to talk about is the Baal Shem Tov's meeting Achia Shiloini. The Baal Shem Tov life is divided in the Sikhs into three parts. The Baal Shem Tov lived 62 years. In some places it's written that the Baal Shem Tov lived 52 years. It's a stira. And the answer that's brought is that Baal Shem Tov was supposed to live 52 years like Shmuel Anovi. He had a shaykh as the Shmuel Anovi 52 years. And Derek Agav, it says that Baal Shem Tov, that the Baal Shem Tov's neshama was a nitzitz from Rasag, or Tzad Yegor, which is why the Baal Shem Tov used to quote Tevis from the Rasag, like Ethem, Kshir the Tevis Bechelka, the Tevis Bekulei, Lu Yedai Tevavisev, and Azelche, from the Rasag. It says that Shemuel Anovi, the Baal Shem Tov was a neshama, a nitzitz from the Rasag. But he also had a shaykh as the Shmuel Anovi. But that the ten years that he learned with Achia, Ashi Lani, the Bashan Tepashit was not in this world. So in, in earth years, he lived 62 years, but in terms of Avoid, he was on this world for 52 years. So his life is divided into three 26, 10, and 26. The three together calls the Shema Vaya Haniste and Shema Vaya Nigre. The first 26 years of his life was the Shema Vaya Haniste. He was a concealed tzaddik, the Madriga Vaya, which is concealed. The last 26 years, he was a revealed tzaddik, Shema Vaya Nigre. And in between was exactly 10 years when he learned with Achiyah Shalim, with his Rebbe, Moidi Rabbi Baal Achai. The Baal Shem Tev never identified his Rebbe by his name in the, what we have from the Baal Shem Tev. He called my master, my teacher, Baal Achai, the source of Chai. Chaya means Chaya Yechida. And then the Rishikha from the Rebbe, in Tavshah Yud Pinchas, I think, the Rebbe explains why his name was Achiyah Shalim, Baal Achai. But, in the Toldos, Yankov Yasef, in Kama Mekemis, the Toldos writes, that the Baal Shem Tev told him who his Rebbe was, and that his Rebbe was Achi HaShilei. And um, the, so the Baal Shem Tev was 26 years. On his 26th birthday, Chai El Tov paid out. He met his Rebbe Achi HaShilei. Ten years later, Chai El Tov Tzadik Dalit. The Baal Shem Tev, in the words of the Baal Shem Tev, we finished learning, I revealed myself. Baal Shem Tev became a Rebbe. And this we'll talk about in the next